we've got some very, uh, quite a few veterans in this group that have been on uh, numerous trips. Right over here, for example. <laughs> what is it? Four, fifth, sixth? Well, it depends how you count it. Yeah, yeah, every single Sixth, trip counts. Afghanistan Sixth. counts, India counts, everything yeah. counts. Jaffer's been on seven or eight trips. Yeah, there you go. See? <laughs> and then there's Farhana. You can't miss her. She... <laughs> We've got some um, new faces and some familiar faces as well. Hi, uh, My name is Salman. I'm a dentist by profession, and this is my first trip with GKF. So I'm looking forward to getting started. I mean, I'd die. That's it. <laughs> Without Inayat, these trips would not be possible. That Some of the logistical possible. issues that he deals with behind the scenes, um, you know what, he spends countless hours working on these trips. So on the outside, he may seem a little bit rough around the edges, but on the inside, he's got a heart of gold. Um, my name is Asfah This is my 11th Iraq trip. <laughs> Not sure how many other ships have been on. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's part of the funny too. And I'm here because of my parents. <laughs> so, yeah. Just because I do of us, right? I do enjoy it. It's fun. Oh, good. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum. I'm Farhana. And, uh, <laughs> Where? Who do I do? <laughs> Who, uh, where do you come from? What do you do? <laughs> I'm from Toronto and I'm a medical laboratory technician. And how many trips have you been on? Too many. Too many, okay. <laughs> Too many, yes. You know, we're here, we're, not everyone's getting great sleep, someone's stomach might not be feeling well, they might not be perfectly polite with you. Do your best to say please and thank you, but if somebody's, basically the way me and Farhana interact is not how you guys should interact. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I, I, like we're working sometimes in a very high, high risk sedation and things are not going great. And if someone just say, go get me that tool, it's not because we're talking bad to you. It's just a stressful situation. Please do your best to help. Give everyone a little bit of slack here and just let it go, okay? And and if there is a if there is a, like a an issue or a personality clash, let's talk it out. Let's work it out. Let's make, let's be, make the best out of this, okay? Like um, we're all here to serve our imam and and like let's let's do our best akhlaq and and make that happen. Thank you so much. So. Global Kindness Foundation, I think, needs three kinds of help. First, we need uh, everybody's prayers. Going into these areas, sometimes it is an, on a sort of a wish and a prayer, as they say. We're going into areas sometimes that we've never been to. Prayers, I think, are the most important part. Financially, yes, there are a lot of expenses that need to be done. It is strictly a charity. Nobody makes money on this uh, organization. All the volunteers are strictly that volunteers. We do not have any paid employees or anything like that. And the other thing is we need volunteers. Every single trip needs a lot of volunteers. The more volunteers we have, the more work we can do. So I think those are the three main areas that we would need help with. Well, it was a long journey. There's quite a few delays along the way. But um, managed to get here in the end. <laughs> and uh, looking forward to getting started. Today, is, uh, we've visited the home already, had breakfast, and now we're on our way to see the school for the first time to start setting up. Um, and then hopefully start seeing patients tomorrow. I'm hoping uh, I'm going to get some training. <laughs> he's, told me th he's told me he's throwing me in the deep end. So yeah. we'll have to see if I sink or swim. And then uh, we'll see how it goes from there. A lot of patients are anxious of dentists. And a lot of patients are anxious of dental treatments. And for me, the way we reassure our patients in the UK is they know that what kind of structure there is. They know what to expect when they walk in. For some of the orphans we'll be treating with GKF, they'll have never been to a dentist before. And I think they'll obviously be more anxious and more worried about what's happening. And I hope we can change their minds on um, dentistry and also healthcare in general um, and to look after them and for them to be healthier for the rest of their lives will be the main thing for me. Uh, dentistry is all about prevention. Uh, we're not just going there to treat children, we're going there to change the rest of their lives. So if we can teach them how to look after themselves properly with the doctors, the optometrists and the dentists all working together, then theoretically the rest of their lives should be changed and they'll teach those lessons on to other people, um, to their children in the future and hopefully that's how GK will make a long lasting difference. Kids, you got two minutes. Yeah. All right, so 45 seconds to a minute, you've lost already. Now you got a minute to figure out what's going on. This gives you an extra minute to figure things out. My name is Zulfikar El Musawi. I'm an anesthesiologist from Toronto, Canada. I provide the sedation here on this trip for the, for the children, for the dental procedures. Obviously, a lot of them being very young, um, they don't they're not cooperative, they're not going to tolerate this stuff. So 
we have to sedate them in order to, uh, to allow us to do the work that they need. I've wanted to do something like this for many years. It's been a thought of mine, you know, going through medical school even before then, my residency training, and now I've been practicing for four years. When you're doing residency, it's way too hectic. But now that I finished, I was looking for something that kind of aligned with my beliefs and kind of the goals that I wanted to attain and something that uh, really kind of spoke to me. When I heard about Global Kindness Foundation, the work that they were doing, I had friends that had been doing it, so I was able to kind of really speak to them in depth about it. Everything that they do, their philosophy, uh, the way that they help, it's just so fantastic. Uh, I just wanted to be part of it. I did everything I could. I contacted the president of the, of the organization, Hasnain Duji, and uh, we got the ball, ball rolling several months ago. Now we're here, alhamdulillah. The vision group would sit together and ask ourselves every year, what can we do better? So this year we are bringing a little more equipment. Hopefully, we'll be able to do better screening. So this is called an auto-refractor. We're going to put it on the table, inshallah, and uh, pre-test the kids when they come. It's the starting point of to figure out what the uh, prescription is going to be, and then we'll fine-tune it uh, with the doctor. This is to determine the prescription of the, of the child that we're going to see, and the other one is to look at the back of the eye. Once everything is done, we'll prescribe the glasses, inshallah, within 24 hours. Last year what we had done was we were able to really dispense the glasses before we leave and this year we want to continue doing that and making sure that, that all the kids that we have tested and prescribed glasses have actually we've given it to them and see for ourselves that they are working. Okay guys, we are heading to the, co the street called Shara Sanatar in, in, in Arabic. In that center street, lots of malls and also lots of restaurants, lots of coffee shops, lots of, you know, you name it, like a Robson in Vancouver. We had a very busy morning. We started late, but we saw about 200 kids in the morning uh, before lunchtime. And then after lunchtime, we saw a few kids and we've broken out now because we don't have any more uh, children to see. So it's nice, it's nice to come out and see what, what, what the city looks like, you know? But today we've had much and we've had a chance. And inshallah, tomorrow we're back to work. <laughs> Hopefully on a full day, full day schedule. High point in Karbala for us was to see that, that whole group meshing together and becoming a team. We have people coming from different parts of the world, different skills, different um, strengths. Seeing all those people finding a niche in the team, finding what their capabilities are, and in some cases actually pushing their um, comfort zone, getting them to think outside the box, and getting the team to mesh into a, a, a single unit almost that's working for one goal. So it allows us to plan for future missions by knowing approximately how many patients per day we can see, by how many doctors, and then we can plan accordingly how much anesthetic and supplies to bring. Also, at the end of a mission, we know if this mission was able to treat approximately how many patients with how much treatment, and then we can calculate the approximate value of the work that we created. And that way, when we approach other groups to do work, we can say, we can treat your school X amount of patients, the value of the work will be this much. Donors are also interested to know how their donations are coming back. So it really depends on the, on the philosophy and the purpose of the camp. If the camp is an emergency walk-in clinic type of camp, we're gonna see a lot more patients, but it's just a quick five, 10 minute, or 15 minute procedure per patient. Whereas we're doing comprehensive care in this camp on children, so the average treatment time length is 30 minutes to an hour and a half sometimes. So therefore a provider can treat five patients a day as opposed to 25 patients a day. Karbala was the, the first time that I did the sedation. So it was really like getting thrown into the deep end with, with all the stuff that we were doing. I think the high point for me was just seeing the appreciation that the families have. And not the children at the time, because the children kind of really don't like you after you, you had to kind of give them the sedation and they wake up with, with a numb mouth. But the, the parents were just so thankful for everything that we did. That's something that it just stuck with me. There was this one child who he had an extra medical problems. And just helping his mother, talking her through what to expect afterwards, um, giving them medication to take home with them for pain, seeing them the next day when they came back, just the smile 
on their faces, their appreciation for the work that we're doing. It's kind of reciprocal. I mean, she's thanking me for, and, and the whole team for, for helping her son, and I'm there thanking her for giving us the opportunity to help. That was what really kind of stuck with me from the first day. Yesterday I was lucky enough that Hassan and Fatima organized a trip for us to Samara, uh, Kadhamain and Balad. So yesterday I got to see six of the Imams who I've never been to their shrines before. So that was an amazing experience. But while I was there and looking around me at, and at the people who were there, it only made me want to come back to the school and help even more for people in this country because you just realize how war-torn and how uh, disrupted everyone's lives have become. Uh, as you're driving towards Samara, there were roadblocks on the way, there were bullet holes in the walls, um, the dome has been newly built and the 11th Imam's uh, shrine. Uh, all of this tells me that this is a still a war-torn country that's still recovering and we need to do everything we can to kind of help these children uh, who've been displaced, who've lost their parents and so combining the ziyarat trip with something like charity work has made it a more fulfilling experience for me that's made it more satisfying and I don't think I can go on ziyarat again without doing something like this at the same time. I think this has strengthened my belief in the importance of charity work. I think it's something that we quickly neglect when we get back home and it's something we need to keep at the forefront of our minds uh, about how important charity is, what our religion tells us about it um, and how we can continuously give back to these communities around the world. Uh, we've only, I've only seen a tiny picture of how much treatment these children need, what other problems they've got. I can make dental treatment a priority on someone's list back in the UK because they haven't got as many problems. Over here, unfortunately, something like dental care is at the bottom of people's list. They think about family, food, shelter first before they think about dental care. And therefore, I've realized that we prioritize things very differently to people in these countries. And we need to do our best to help these people get back to a better sense of health and also look at what other ways they can, we can help them in. Who had some sort of blood problem, maybe sickle cell anemia, something like this. Um, he doesn't have a mother, he, he has a father and is living with his grandmother. Um, he didn't look very well at all, very pale, very yellow. Uh, as we started to talk, it appeared that the boy had had some previous treatment, but because the father was a, just a day labourer, um, and didn't have a sort of consistent income, they couldn't afford to continue with the treatment. So wasn't, hadn't taken anything for three or four months at least. And we realised that the family just couldn't afford treatment. And so the GKF volunteers have come together uh, to hopefully fund this child's future years of treatment uh, and make sure that he's well supported. And we realised that the extended family cannot simply do this. And it's only by coming to places like this you find out about these problems in the world. By hearing stories second hand, it never does the same thing as you seeing a child first hand who's suffering. Some of the kids do wear glasses. It's not that all of them is a failure. A lot of the kids, we found that every year that we come, there are more and more kids wearing the glasses. One of the excitement that we had was we saw one girl actually wearing the frame that we had dispensed last year. And this year, she had a change of prescription and we were able to give her a new pair of glasses. And she was very grateful. This year, one of the advice that we were given was that uh, to improve compliance for the students is to examine the teachers of the schools as well. And so we did that. And the whole idea of that was hopefully that they understand that what happens to the students when they don't have the glasses. That was one of the things. The other thing was we were really surprised that some of the teachers themselves couldn't see, particularly close up. And I'm sure this particular teacher that we had, she was just over 40 years old and we were able to provide her a pair of glasses that she was able to read and she will hopefully uh, be able to uh, Im implement that in her class. Mom Sin is the grandson of the Prophet and the way he inspires me to do what I do today is he was a man who stood up for the values that he believed in uh, against an oppressor who did not share the same values. And uh, when the oppressor asked him to join him, Imam Hussein said that he couldn't sign up to someone who had values like this. And therefore he stood up for values such as justice, uh, morality, and helping the orphans and the oppressed. And that's what we've come to do here uh, at GKF. I've been waiting many, many years, you know, finishing my schooling. And so when I heard from uh, a dental uh, friend of mine back in Canada about something like this, uh, I couldn't wait to book my tickets. I couldn't wait to arrange everything to just leave work, come here, helping little children with no one to kind of take care of them like that. It's phenomenal. It's just, it's a feeling that you get uh, when you know um, you're doing something uh, inspired by the Imam. Uh, there's nothing like it. So today was our last day here at the uh, Sayyidah Ruqayya Orphanage in Karbala. 
Oh my um, God. Tough day. Some of us yeah. worked pretty hard. I'm just looking to uh, move on to Najaf now.